political taboos in the fight against the far-right government. Riled by coalitions of, of relent, a coalition's relentless power trip, Jewish opposition parties pledged not to participate in the Knesset's final votes on legislation aimed at overhauling the judiciary. Israeli diplomats and envoys are quitting their post in protest. Army reservists are objecting to service in mass, affecting every unit from combat troops to the Air Force. Tech companies and venture capitalists firms are relocating abroad and transferring out hundreds of millions of dollars. Artists, writers, and intellectuals are calling on world leaders to shun meetings with senior Israeli officials, including the prime minister. None of these groups will admit it, but this is, by all accounts, one of the most impressive BDS campaigns we've ever witnessed. In the topsy-turvy Israel, Israel of today, today. Uh, boycotts... Um, I'm getting an echo. Let me see here. Boycotts of ethnic through not explicitly named as such, have become central strategies of the Israeli government protest movement. Large swaths of society are not just distancing themselves from the government's agenda, but actually persuading nationwide disruption and international intervention to stop it. The economy, security, and day-to-day -day life are all necessary sacrifices in the name of saving democracy. At this scale, the movement has gone beyond merely ending public complicity. It is, in effect, a civil revolt. Ironically, these methods of civil resistance are being encouraged by figures who spent years undermining those who use them. Yar Lapid and Nesset opposition leader and former prime minister is continuing to call for mass demonstrations and strikes and has urged municip meant, eh, municipalities not to cooperate with certain government ministry units, leaders later describing such political expression as part of Israel. Israeli's deep democratic instinct. This is the same Lapid who accused Israeli anti-occupation groups of subversion for exposing military abuses, oversaw the outlawing of pal Palestinian human rights NGOs as terrorists, and demanded American anti-BDS laws be used to punish the ice cream company Ben & Jerry's for not selling products in illegal West Bank settlements, blasting the divestment as shameful as surrender to anti-Semitism. <coughs> Israel's own anti-boycott law enacted in 2011, now technically hovers all, over all these new dissidents, enabling any citizen to sue the protesters for causing financial or reputational harm to the state or entities under its control. The Israeli Supreme Court, the institution that the protest movement has been fighting so hard to defend, enthusiastically approved of the anti-democratic law in 2015, calling boycotts a form of political terror. Bigoted, dishonest, shameful, and an attempt to annihilate the Jewish state. Israeli politicians, including from the center 
and center left saw the price tag on a civil rights as necessary not just to stifle Palestinians, but to deter Jewish Israelis from boycotting the settlements. Now, if the right chooses so, the anti-government movement could be made to pay a literal price for its sedition. We told you so. The cognitive dissidence of this movement is not lost on Palestinians. In, two, in the two decades since the BDS movement was launched, Palestinians and their allies have been smeared, censored, and attacked for calling on citizens, companies, and governments to use nonviolent tactics to pressure Israel into ending its human rights abuses. It demands explicitly rooted into international law, are to achieve equality for Palestinians in Israel. End military rule in the occupied territories and allow Palestinian refugees to return to their homeland. Basic rights to which any other country would not be so controversial. However, far from even respecting the right to challenge Israel, BDS has been aggressively denounced as counterproductive, at best anti-Semitic at worst. A slew of U.S. and European laws and policies are effective criminalizing the movement, defining it as a form of racism. Even liberal American Jewish groups, some of whom entertain the best the idea of conditioning military aid to Israel and last week called for revoking the visa of Israel's finance minister still adamantly insist that they do not still adamantly insist that they neither support nor participate in the BDS movement. The distancing is in many ways a cop out that reveals the hypocrisy and racism at the heart of the debate around BDS. It is perfectly reasonable, it seems, to shun Israeli officials, cut off financial ties, and disrupt public spaces when mainstream Jews call for it. But when Palestinians living under Israeli oppression demand the same, their calls are scrutinized, rejected, and even punished. It is also telling that BDS tactics are currently being legitimized in the name of helping Jewish Israelis protect status quo, anti, in which racial supremacy and military occupation were the norm. I'll be wrapped in more democratic clothing, using BDS in the name of equality, freedom, and justice for Palestinians, though, is an existential threat. The speed in which many abroad are suddenly embracing harsher language and policy ideas against the Israeli government, including members of the U.S. Congress, shows how even well-intentioned groups are still acting as gatekeepers to what Palestinians are allowed to say and have, and do and have. The discrediting of Palestinian voices, conditioning of their rights on Israel, and the refusal to hold the only Jewish state accountable to international law is precisely what has bought Israel the time and impunity, impunity to arrive at its latest fascistic stage. Is, there, is it therefore very tempting for Palestinians to tell the world, we told you so, but for now, in the hope that this moment many serve as a lesson Perhaps it is best to simply say to all 
that Israel's new BDS activists welcome.